the service for Heath Gum on TV and watch it. I was so proud when I was trying to find Ryan in the audience, right? Because I knew he was family. And here he comes out and opens the, the, the service with a, with a song. And uh, Ryan, I'm so proud of you. It just was awesome. It was a beautiful way to start that service. And talking about the importance of following the sun. And we're, we started a series next, uh, last week. And uh, I want us to look at the notes that you have for this week because I'm going to do a review. But we started the things that must soon take place. And we're asking four questions in this series. First of all, what are we to be waiting for? What are we to be watching for? What are we looking for? What's going to come as a thief? And last week, we began to look at the Old Testament. We started out with the oldest book, probably Job. And Job was saying, I know my Redeemer lives, and he will stand one day upon the earth, and in my body, in my flesh, I will see him. Then we moved over to Isaiah, and Isaiah said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. He will rule from the house of David, and he will bring peace and justice to the earth. Then we looked at Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, he talked about this one, the little horn, the Antichrist, who will come and make war with the saints until the Ancient of Days, Jesus Christ comes, and he will, Jesus will take his kingdom from the Antichrist, give it to the saints, and will be an eternal kingdom. And then he told Daniel in chapter 12, now, you know, blessed are those who wait till after the Antichrist has come, but you don't have to worry about it, because you're going to go to your rest, you're going to die, but you're going to rise to your inheritance. Then we have Zechariah in the 14th chapter. He said, the day of the Lord is coming, and I'm looking forward to the day of the Lord. And he said, the day of the Lord is when uh, God will take vengeance against the nations who have come against Israel, and Jesus Christ himself will set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and he will bring with him his saints. And then Enoch, which was seventh generation from Adam in Jude, said, that he was looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will come with ten thousands of his saints. And then we looked at Matthew 24, which is a gospel written primarily with the Jews in mind, but written for everyone. And we saw the words of Jesus. And he said, starts out because the disciples came to him and asked him some questions. They said, first of all, when shall these saints be? When's the sign of your coming? When's the end of the age? And Jesus said, well, first there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and nation will rise up against nation. That's just the beginning. They're going to deliver you up to time of tribulation. They're going to seek to kill you. And then the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, which is the Antichrist, which is going to come and set himself to be worshipped in the temple, which Daniel, we all looked at, he's going to be revealed. And he said, be careful that you flee in those days. Because in those days, if those days weren't shortened, the very chosen, the very elect would be deceived. But as the lightning comes out of the east and strikes to the west, he said, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then he gives, this is what's going to happen. Immediately after the tribulation in those days, Christ will come in the clouds with his holy angels. And his angels are going to gather all of his elect and chosen from all over the world. And then he gives the illustration of just as the fig tree. You may know the season, you won't know the day. And no man knows the hour except the Son of God, except God the Father himself. And then he gave the illustration as in the days of Noah. They didn't know the flood was coming until Noah shut the door and the rain came and took him away. And then he gives the illustration of the ten virgins in chapter 25. That they were supposed to have their oil in their lamps and have them ready to go because the bridegroom was coming. The word came that the bridegroom was coming. Some didn't have enough oil so they went to go get some. While they were gone he came and took those who were ready with him. And then he gave the illustration of the ten talents. I'm trying to go this very fast because this is where we were last week. Right? Just to give you an overview of where we're at. Uh, some he gave five, some two, one, one. And because everyone is going to give an account. When Jesus Christ comes again in the clouds, they were given an account, and he will judge the nations. And then we finished up last week with this beautiful uh, saying that he had to Caiaphas. After Jesus was arrested, he was taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, and the other scribes. And Caiaphas asked him, are you the Christ? And he said, I am who, I, who you say I am, but you will never see me again. You won't see me again until you see me coming in the clouds, in glory. Amen? That's where we left off. 
So now you have a second page of notes. If you didn't get your first page, they're there in, in front of you, and we've added the second page. Now next week we'll add a third page, and the following week we'll have a fourth page, so you have a little folder brochure for the message series. Let's go take a look at Mark 13. Let's bow together. Father, your word is sharp, it's powerful. It's what changes lives. As the Spirit of God takes your word, it transforms us. And Father, you tell us we're to be watching and waiting and praying and what it is that we are to be looking forward to. So Lord, I pray that you'll open up those that you inspired to write this word and that, Father, we might be able to have understanding and transformation of our own lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to go in chronological order from Mark. If you're in the New Testament, it'll go Mark, and we'll just move right through, through, uh, through Paul's writing. So you won't have to be flipping back and forth, all right? Let's go to Mark chapter 13. This is uh, written primarily with the Romans in mind, but I want you to mark a few words. This is why I've invited you to bring your Bibles so you can do some marking. And if you have an electronic device, you can mark those as well. Look at 33. Take heed, watch, and pray. Would you underline so that's what this, what are we watching for? Watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It's like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper, there it is, watch again, underline that, and then the third time, watch. Therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening at midnight at the crowing of the rooster or in the morning. We don't know when Christ is going to return, but watch and pray because he's coming. Now let's go over to Luke. Luke, I'm trying to go over all the passages that have to do with the coming of Christ. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke written with the Greeks in mind, particularly. Luke chapter 21. And if you aren't with me, raise your hand. So last week I, uh, some people said, yeah, you were kind of going too fast. So I don't want to go too fast. I mean, Super Bowl's not till four, right? So I think we're good. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Luke 21, verse 27. Then they will see. Now, see, this isn't some, something we're not going to see that just snatched and gone. That's not what Luke is saying we're watching for here. Now, notice this. They will see the Son of Man coming in a what? Have you seen that before? Absolutely. You'll see him coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. So here's Jesus Christ coming back in the clouds and look up because the end is near and your redemption, full redemption, draws near. Now, let's look at verse 36. Watch, there it is again. And pray, there it is again. See, this is what the church should be watching and praying about. Always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. Every one of us are going to stand before the Son of God, either as a believer or as an unbeliever. And the eternal destiny is going to be dependent upon that. We'll look at that in the weeks to come. But look at uh, John now, John the 14th chapter. I quoted this uh, verse to you. A beautiful passage of scripture when Jesus was on his way to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane passing probably vineyards or passing the archways that have the, the drawings and pictures of vineyards on it. Uh, in any case, uh, this is what he says in John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be. So here's this beautiful promise. I'm coming, and I'm preparing a place for you, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to get you when I come. Now, notice, I'm going to have you turn back to John 5. I said I wasn't going to do that, but I don't want to miss out John 5, verse 28. John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Everyone who has died, everyone in the graves, they're going to hear the voice. And they're going to come forth. They're going to come to life. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. How many resurrections? How many? One. To life. 
Now notice this. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So we're all going to be involved in one resurrection or the other, either resurrection to life, eternal life with Jesus, or eternal separation from God in hell. We'll talk about that in the weeks to come. Now let's go look at Luke. Luke not only wrote the book of Luke, he also wrote the book of Acts. And the reason I like Luke is because Luke is probably the most accurate of the historians. And as you know, I was a history major. I love history. Uh, I love Acts because it's wonderfully done. Let's go to Acts. Are you with me so far? Everybody staying up with me? You all there? Okay, let's go to Acts chapter 1. I want you to notice this. I want you to underline some things. Acts chapter 1. By the way, how many of you have seen a consistency in what's being said so far? Do you see how it all flows and all fits? Now, let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 9. Now, when he had spoken these saints, he just given you to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. In verse 9, he says, Now, when he had spoken these word things, while they watched, would you underline that? They watched this whole thing. They saw it. As they watched, he was taken up in a cloud. And what, it wasn't like they were standing there. Where'd he go? They watched him ascend until a cloud. Now, I don't think the cloud deck was on the ground. So there was this watching as he ascended. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly, he was watching this. Toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, underline this next phrase, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go to heaven. How did he leave? In a cloud. And we keep seeing, I'm going to return in the cloud. It's going to be something they're going to see. It's going to be a visible return. Now go over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Again, Luke's writing. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. When's that going to happen? When's that time of refreshing? Notice, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. What do the prophets say? Jesus Christ is going to come and establish his kingdom. He's going to restore all things. Creation as it was, mankind as it was, government as it should be, he's going to restore it all. Now let's go to Paul. Let's go look at Paul's writings. They really get exciting. They're all exciting, but they really get exciting when you get to Paul. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. You there with me? And the reason we give you these notes, so you can mark these. So what are we watching? What are we looking for? What's going to come as a thief? Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, 24. But now Christ is risen from the dead, right? Amen? And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or who have died. For since by man came death, that's Adam, by man, Christ, also came the resurrection from the dead. So in Adam, you see, we all die, but in Christ we can be resurrected. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. When? When? But each one in his own order. Christ first. Afterward, those who are Christ, when? As his, at his coming. So this is when we're going to be made alive with Christ when he comes. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father. So I'm coming. You're going to be resurrected to life. And then I'm going to establish the kingdom. Got it? All right. 
Notice verse chapter 15, verse 51 to 58. Same chapter, verse 51. Are you with me? It's so quiet out there. Are the lights up enough? Can you see? Well, thank you. Behold, behold, verse 51, chapter 15, I tell you a mystery. I tell you a hidden truth. We shall not all sleep. We're not going to all die. But we're all going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I like this German term that Irma gave me, Augenblick. Didn't that mean twinkling or twitch of an eye? Like that. Yeah. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the what? You're going to see this over and over again, the last trump. This is when we're going to be changed. The twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. In other words, we have a physical body, has to be united with with a revived new spiritual body. So we have a body similar to Christ when he rose again. For this corruption body must put on incorruption, and this mortal has to put on immortality. So when this corruption, it's kind of confusing, has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then will be brought past the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, but the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who gives us what? The victory through who? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, what should we be doing now? This is what it says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right? Let's go to Philippians 3. Now, I'm not going to any any books. I'm not going to any tapes. I'm not going to any preconceived. I'm just walking through the Bible with you. That's all I'm doing. Now look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait, underline that, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what are we waiting for? Who will transform your lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, to the working of that which is able to subdue all things to him. See how consistent that is? Through everything that has been said throughout the scriptures to this point, we're going to be changed when Christ returns and he establishes his kingdom. Now notice 1 Thessalonians 4. This is when it's going to really get good. And this is when I still have all the time in the world to preach, right? Ah, some of you don't say things so, but Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4. Because this is when it's really... 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians are just amazing passages. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Make sure we're all there. We're all there? All right. Verse 13. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. Lest your sorrow is others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have died in Christ. Do you see what's happening when Christ comes? Who's he bringing? Who's he bringing? All these saints with him. All those who have died. Gives us a little more insight here. Why? Because look here. Look at what's, what's next. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive remain until the coming of the Lord. Will by no means precede those who have died. In other words, when Jesus returns, he's bringing those with him who have already died in Christ. Now some of us are still alive when he comes. Now notice what's going to happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with what? There it is again. With the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Why? We've got six feet further to go. Then we who are alive and remain, because by the way, what's Christ bringing with him? He's not bringing people back with bodies. He's bringing back the spirits of those who have gone. The Bible says to die is to go immediately into the presence of God. That's because he emptied paradise. At his death. Now, I'm not, I can preach a whole message on that. 
But if you die today in the Lord, you go immediately, your spirit, but your body's still in the grave or in the, in the water or cremated ash or whatever it is. So when he comes, he's bringing your spirit and he's going to reunite it with your body. That's what he's talking about here. Now, notice this. We who are alive and remain will caught up together with him in the clouds. What? There it is again. He's coming in the clouds with the trumpet. To meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, note here, the word rapture is nowhere in the Bible. What you have is a catching away or a snatching out. I think some word, Dick, I may be wrong. Parousia may not be the word. Do you know that word? No, the word snatching or catching away? Rapture in English. Okay, well, I'll talk to you about that later. The word itself is not there. It's not there. It's a snatching or catching away, which is important. But it still means the same thing. Rapture still means you're gone. So when is this? We got to go into the fifth chapter. Remember, the chapters were not in the original translations because it was written as a letter. We put it there so you can find references, find verses. So what is... Chapter 5, verse 1, start with a little word, what? But. But. Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, he's just been talking about. You have no need that I should even write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as what? Now, what's the day of the Lord that comes as a thief? He's coming in the clouds and are catching up to him. That's a thief. That's coming as a thief. Now notice this. For when they say peace and safety, verse 3, and sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, but let us watch. There it is again, and be sober. Folks, you say, was this message important? Absolutely it's important. Because... God tells us it's important. That's what we're watching and waiting and being sober. It should bring a sobriety to our evangelism, sobriety to our life and our words and our actions. Because one day we're going to give an account of our life before Him. Now notice this. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. You know, none of us are going to stand before God for our sin. He didn't point us to wrath, but to salvation. Therefore, comfort one another these words. Okay, now hang on. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then we're going to end with a couple more passages. But I'm going to give you my interpretation that you'll hear nowhere else when we get to chapter 2. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means you'll not hear it anywhere else. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter <laughs> Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. Now notice this. Since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation or affliction those who trouble you. He's talking about believers. He's talking about the church. And to give you who are troubled rest when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When are you going to get your rest? When are you going to get it? When Jesus is revealed from heaven with his holy angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those. See, this isn't coming and taking the church away and then then a a period of time of flaming. This is immediately. This is a time in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. See, at the rapture, he's not glorified. He's just taking us out. He's glorified when he comes with us, changed and establishes his kingdom. See what I'm saying? There's a rapture. There's a snatching away. I don't care where you put it. You just have to make the distinction of what it's there for. That's when the transformation and the resurrection takes place. But Jesus comes after he's transformed us with us to establish his kingdom. Now notice this. 
You'll be glorified in these saints and be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you is believed. So when is this going to take place? Go to the second chapter. There's absolutely no confusion about this. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering into him. Let's underline that phrase. Concerning his coming and our gathering to him. Is there any one that doesn't understand what he's saying there? Okay. Notice this. Don't be troubled or shaken in mind, either by spirit or by word, a letter as if from us, as though that day of Christ had already come. See, somebody was circulating a letter. Somebody was saying, hey, Christ has already come. He's saying, don't, don't be shaken up by that because here's the truth. Notice this. Let no one deceive you, verse 3. Please take notice of this. For that day, what day? The day of his coming or gathering to him? For that day will not come unless there's a falling away and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, who is that? Who have we seen in Daniel? The Antichrist. Now, notice, we know it's the Antichrist because look at the next verse. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Remember what he said in Daniel? This little horn's going to be making war against the saints and then the Ancient of Days will going to come. He's saying, hey, now, now, you guys, this is going to blow you away but I'm going to say it and it's going to get me in trouble. Can Jesus come today? No, though I believe in the intimate return. Why? Because there has to be a fallen away and the man of lawlessness has to be revealed first. I'm not going to be popular with that, but I'm just saying this is what the scripture says. Now I live in light of the fact, because I don't know the hour when it be, so I live in light of his soon coming. But now notice this. And now you know what is restraining now in verse 6. That he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. I'm going to stop right there. And this is, you won't hear this anywhere else. But probably from me. But I'll stand on it. I'm going to give you not. I, this is what I believe. So you make a distinction between what scripture is saying and what I believe to be. Y'all with me? Now, I want you to notice a couple of things here, and I'm going to challenge you to go to your Greek. Go to your Greek lexicons, whatever. This verse says, for the mystery of lawlessness, this lawlessness, and I think that's the work of Satan from the very beginning. It's already work in the world. But notice this. When he, he is not capitalized. It's not the Holy Spirit. And you can hear a lot of teachers say the restrainer, the he is the Holy Spirit. It's not he. He is not capitalized there. It cannot be the Holy Spirit. And here's the other thing, because people say, well, this reads, when he, the Holy Spirit, is taken away. No, that word is not taken away. That's not accurate in the Greek. Let me tell you what it is. When he, not capitalized, out of the midst he comes. It's not something that's leaving, it's something that's coming. You hear what I just said? Okay, I'm going to say it again. This phrase, right here, and guys, go to any elite, go to your Greek text. Go to your Greek lexicon. Anybody got one right now? You can go. I just looked it up this morning before I came. Make sure I was right. This is the way it reads. He, not capitalized. What restrains, holds back, will do so until out of the midst he comes. Now let me give you a little insight what I think this is referring to. I believe this is referring to Satan and I'll tell you why. Now, hang on. This is my interpretation. If you go to look at Revelation chapter 12, it says right now that Satan has access to accuse us before God. But a battle is coming with Michael where he will be cast out of heaven and he will no longer be able to accuse us. And it says there that when he's cast, he will come in his full wrath, his full fury against the woman who gave birth to, to the son, which is Israel, and to its offspring, which is the church. Now, what's interesting, if you do a study on the midst, that midst is the same word that's used constantly about what surrounds the throne of God. 
And so what I believe this is saying, the Antichrist is not going to be revealed until until, uh, Satan is cast out of heaven and out of the midst of the heaven he comes. Then he will be revealed. The Antichrist will be revealed. That's my interpretation of that. You can take it for what it's worth, and I'd love to sit and debate with you this week if any of you want to come and talk to me about that. Okay? Take that and set, set that aside because we're not done yet. But it makes perfect sense because, hey, the lawlessness is working. Now he's restraining because he hasn't come out of the midst of heaven yet. So he's, Antichrist isn't going to come until Satan reveals him. Now notice the next verse. And then the lawless one will be revealed. When? When out of the midst he comes. When Satan comes, he's going to be revealed. His last ditch attempt to destroy Christ and his work from all eternity. And so when the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, that's Antichrist, he's going to destroy him. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of who? Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness and deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's my interpretation of that. But it certainly is consistent with all the other scriptures we've looked at. We've got two more to go and we'll be done. Are you, are you having fun yet? All right. Uh, God's word is amazing. Let's just read it. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 8. And the reason I left these last two, and I'll be done, because it is a quarter till. We got one more song that we want to worship with. This tells us, okay, so what should be happening to us because of this? Because of the coming of Christ in the clouds to transform us and change us and to establish his kingdom here upon the earth. Why? Look at this very carefully. Then Titus will do a similar thing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 1 through 8. I charge you therefore, brethren, and listen guys, this is, this is the verse for our time, this passage. I charge you therefore before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, when? At his appearing and at his kingdom. Preach the word. Because we're looking forward to that day, here's what you should be doing. Preach the word. Be ready. In season. Out of season. Convince. Rebuke. Exhort. With all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're living in those days. Well, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they are heaped for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you... You be watchful. There's that word again. In all things, endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And here's Paul's words. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. I am laying my life down for this gospel. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And when is he going to get it? The same time we are, folks. When the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but all who love what? His appearing. Be diligent to come to me quickly. One more passage and we'll be done. Amen? And Titus 2, verse 11 through 13. And we're done. Don't you just love opening God's word and just getting into it? I don't ask that you, you have to necessarily believe what I believe. I teach. I'll be responsible. I'll be accountable to God for what I teach. I want to teach the truth. But you can't argue with God's word. That's what changes lives. Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying, see, this is what we do in this life, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, We should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present age. What are we looking for? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself with his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these saints, exhort, rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Okay. We looked at the Old Testament, we looked at the words of Jesus, and looked at, looked at uh, 
the John's and Mark's and Luke's account. Now we looked at Paul's. Next week, we're going to go look at Peter and John's. Let's bow together. Father, we can have a lot of division about all this eschatology. And, you know, that to me isn't as important as who you are. That you are the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. And through you, we have eternal life. And one day, because you're preparing a place for us, you will come again, receive us, transform us, resurrect us. And we will together come with you in the clouds, and you will establish your kingdom, you'll set your feet upon the Mount of Olives, and you will reign here upon the earth. And Father, there's a resurrection to life, and there's a resurrection to death and separation. There's a resurrection to heaven, and there's a resurrection to hell. And Father, I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice today, if there's anyone here that's never acknowledged you as their Lord and Savior, that you are the Son of God who died for them, that they would receive you by simply saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I ask you to come in my life, transform my life, forgive me my sin, that they'll do that so they can have the resurrection to life. But Father, that's what our mission is all about. We are on a mission to baptize, to make disciples, to teach, Father, until you come. The great commission, the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart and to love one another, our brethren, with all our soul. So, Lord, wherever your word needs to be applied today, I pray that you apply it, that we would be diligent to study your word. And then as men, pastors like myself or others come along and begin to teach or books or tapes or seminars, that we'll go weigh that with what the word says. And then, Father, that you would bring us into the truth of your word and what we're to be watching and waiting for. You are coming again, and we thank you for that. We've sung about it today. We've sung about it last week. We'll sing about it in the next couple of weeks. Father, you are the God of history. It's your story, as we've said so many times. And, Lord, we can be part of it, and we are part of it. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.